Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the CAR 2022 Hybrid Legislative Breakfast. I'm Pam Dent, and I'm CAR's new 2022 president. Protecting property. <laughs> Thank you. Protecting property rights and home ownership opportunities is one of the pillars in CAR's strategic plan, but advocacy does not stop at the ballot box. Working with our colleagues at Virginia Realtors, we impact the General Assembly every day. Advocacy takes many forms. As Realtors, we make our political voices heard through our individual investment to the Realtors Political Action Committee, or RPAC. I'm happy to report that we have over 550 CAR investor members this year and 35 major investors. Oh, 37, hot off the presses. For the seventh year, CAR has garnered the National Association of Realtors RPAC Triple Crown Award for our performance. Many thanks to RPAC's chair, Kim Armstrong, and Vice Chair Peg Gilliland for this outstanding accomplishment. We are very fortunate to have much of our legislative delegation with us this morning. We have both seasoned legislators from a variety of backgrounds in our delegation to provide a welcome balance of political wisdom, focused energy, and new ideas. I would like to introduce and welcome our representatives to CAR this morning. State Senator Cree Deeds represents the 25th Senate District, which includes Allegheny, Bath, Highland, Nelson, and Rock Ridge counties, as well as a portion of Albemarle County. Cree has served in the State Senate since 2001. He served in the House of Delegates from 1992 to 2001. Delegate Rob Bell is about to start his 10th term representing the 58th district. The 58th district includes parts of Albemarle, Lavanna, Green, and Rockingham counties. 57th district delegate Sally Hudson is starting her second term in the house. The 57th district includes the city of Charlottesville, as well as a portion of Albemarle County. The 25th district, which includes Augusta County, Rockingham, and portions of Western Albemarle County, features second term delegate Chris Runyon. Today, I've asked CARS Government Affairs Director, Neil Williamson, to moderate this panel. As president of the Free Enterprise Forum, Neil is starting his 18th year working with state and local governments to protect property rights and home ownership opportunities. Please join me in welcoming Neil to the stage. Thank you, Pam. Good morning. I am um, thrilled to have people in the building. It, is, it has been a, uh, a long time, and we're thrilled you're here, and we're thrilled with the folks that are on hybrid. Uh, Senator Deeds and I were talking about earlier about legislating committee meetings with Zoom. I don't think we're going to get this toothpaste back in the tube. I think hybrid is going to be our new word, and I think it allows the opportunity for, the, uh, for more people to be engaged. One of the benefits of this season has been higher engagement and lower barriers to entry. Um, and I think that's good for everyone. Um, in Richmond, I, I was thinking about this the other day, Richmond is a little bit like Mary Poppins. The winds have shifted. Um, with the election of a Republican executive branch and a Republican House of Delegates, and a one-seat democratically controlled Senate, it's somewhat a whole new world. Um, the, the change means a lot in the House. Um, they have not yet 
assigned committee chairs, at least as of last week, maybe they did it this morning, or uh, committee members. You need to, we do, whoops, we do have, we've been working with VAR on legislative initiatives. And I was in Richmond last week and meeting with 17 local GADs and our state uh, government affairs directors. And I, I have four items that I, that we're gonna be bringing forward. We don't have, we have some bills drafted, but they're not ready for public appearance yet. But the number one bill, can anybody guess what the number one bill is gonna be this year? Health healthcare, fourth year running. Um, we have we have a real issue. We need it, and we have we believe we have a, a strong opportunity this year. We have a couple of different ways to attack this, and I'm hopeful that we will. Well, I know we'll have it drafted in time for discussion when the general assembly comes into session. Um, number two is a interesting one. I call it the designated survivor bill. We had a terrible happenstance with um, a sole brokerage where the broker died and they did not have a survivorship plan. Um, this meant that if the agents were actually operating in the real estate market illegally because they didn't have a broker. So uh, VAR is looking to make a legislative fix uh, whereby every two years brokers have to renew their license and there will be a designated survivor line on, on there. So that the whole purpose of that is not to give away the business, but it's for death or disability to maintain a continuity of business and calm in the real estate market. Uh, I don't think there's gonna be any real challenge to that. We're also, cause it's General Assembly time, we're gonna talk HOA and COA, um, cause we do every year. Uh, one of the things we're finding is that um, associations, as you all know, required to turn back their uh, code, uh, their code of development and, and their plan, their association plan within 14 days. What we're finding in some cases is they've delegated that responsibility to a third party. That third party by code isn't responsible for the 14 day deadline. We got to fix that because we need those in order to keep the, the market moving forward. Um, Finally, we have two separate pieces of, in, of, of legislative fixes um, regarding uh, title insurance and the quality of title insurance that can be purchased. You, it was a really bizarre situation that, that I know way too much about, but the idea of, uh, of that title insurance being at, the, uh, being at the highest level, the ULTA level of, uh, of title insurance. There also was an issue of or escrow funds and making certain it's clear who controls what monies where and how that is handled. Um, throughout every session, the VAR Public Policy Committee meets on a weekly basis, Fridays, yay. Um, and every Friday we have a discussion of legislation that's coming forward that has some impact on the real estate business. Um, your VAR team reads every bill that's entered and it's a lot of bills and determines what positions to recommend. And then your fellow realtors make the decision whether to support, oppose, or monitor those bills. I can promise you your VAR government relations team will be in Richmond, working with other local government affairs directors and me occasionally when I'm in Richmond, so that we make certain the realtor voice is heard and that we're able to keep the Commonwealth moving forward. With that being said, I wanted to give the our representatives a few prompting questions and they always answer directly. They never, never meander off to where their topics, honestly. But the, uh, the first question um, posing to Delegate Hudson, considering the significant restrictions on bills by members, what are your legislative priorities? And what, do you have any comments on the four items that I mentioned for the VAR? Well, thank you so much for having us this morning. It's so good to see you in person again this year. Um, you know, I think we, at least in the House yet, don't know what our restrictions are on bills. And so, as you said, there's a lot still to be determined about the basic operations of the House. So final decisions haven't been made and they could be very different if the cap is 10 or 20. 
Um, but most of the, the projects that I'm excited to work on are the ones that I think have the most potential for action in a bipartisan House and Senate, because we do have two parties in different um, corners. And so a lot of them are consumer protection issues, whether lowering the cost of our energy bills or prescription drugs. I think there's a lot of things that are making it harder for families to make ends meet. And I think those are the kind of things that we can get both chambers behind with a little bit of collaboration. And so those are the kinds of things that are top of mind for me. Um, in addition, in, in the healthcare realm, um, picking up some work that I started last session on substance abuse, because that's also something that affects people in every corner of the Commonwealth, whether you're in an urban area or a rural one. Um, and I'm looking forward for us making some serious headway on that, especially because it's a problem that like so many has gotten worse in the last year or two. Um, to the specific uh, questions that you raised, I think the last three are fairly technical um, tweaks and they all sound very sensible. I think on the first one, that's something where I, I think I'm gonna be more open to options in this environment because I think with the split chambers, there may be less um, action on healthcare that picks up on the projects that we started last session. Um, I think that my, my general reaction to some of the association plans had been, this is not my preferred way to solve the problem, but I understand the urgent need and I had, I had preferred some more holistic solutions that would not have been so narrowly tailored to associations, but would make it easier to, to buy health insurance regardless of your membership in that kind of association. I think some of those more holistic solutions may be harder to pass under the current framework. And so I think that makes me more interested in stop gaps um, that could plug the need for people who need health insurance now and, and can't wait for a, a longer plan. You know, we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good in governing a lot. So um, those are sort of my reactions. Does that feel like a straight answer? It does. Wonderful. Uh, Delegate Bell, you and the balance of our delegation have supported our four-year effort to enact legislation providing realtors health care insurance. Do you have any thoughts on this effort? And uh, a little bit toward Delegate Hudson's point, how does the party composition impact your 2022 priorities? I think she um, um, kind of put it out in a pretty, pretty good way in terms of what our options will be and the limitations it would be. So people, you look at Washington and you're kind of used to seeing one party's in charge for a while and then the other party takes over. That has not been our experience in Richmond over my tenure, which now goes back 20 years. So for 20 years, all but two of them have been some form of split government. And so I, I take that back. Now it's been four, but for two years, the last two years of Bob McDonald's term, there was a Republican House, Republican Senate. And now for the last two of Northam's term, there's a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. But for all the other years for something to pass, you had to get buy-in from either a Democratic Senate, a signature by a Democratic governor or both um, for it to pass. And so the notion of split government may um, be atypical in other places, but it's not atypical here. And so the idea of trying to sort of uh, have a conversation with members of the other party of what is what is what are, what are non-starters, what are things that you'd be willing to accept as part of a larger picture uh, and or go in the other direction, maybe there's not gonna be agreement on big things, but we can reach a compromise, not always a consensus, but a compromise on something that's very direct and fixes a problem is, is not alien or foreign to us. So I think of the, the issues you picked, I share Sally's thought that the, the last three, you know, we're always very smart when we're talking to one group and another group says you didn't think of something. So with that caveat, those three seem to be fairly technical uh, and straightforward fixes. And in healthcare, um, again, the parties may have very different big pictures, but in the meantime, you all are left uh, without a solution. And sometimes again, with the parties as they are, it does drive everyone to come up with a perhaps more specific or modest fix, but one that could get you what you're looking for. So I, it may be a better actually higher chance of it being successful than it's been the last two cycles. Now the, the other big caveat um, Delegate Hudson already alluded to, which would be we don't yet know uh, we don't know which who's going to be in what committees. You could guess from people's past committees that they will generally be kept on the committees, but that's not a rule. We don't know who the chairman will be, and especially we don't know who in the executive branch is going to be heading up policy. So uh, Mr. Youngkin has signaled some things in the campaign, but in terms of there's going to come a time when we need to talk to someone in his administration to see what his thoughts are. Again, are there things that are non-starters that would be vetoed? We are not yet at the stage where those conversations can take place. So it's not that we're putting it off. I just think that that's a uh, realistic view of where we are. In terms of some of the priorities I'll be working for or looking at, 
Uh, Senator Deeds and I served together and it's called the Behavioral Health Commission. I guess it's about to, it was traditionally called the Deeds Commission. He hates it when I say that, but that's what everybody calls it but him. And we have identified over the last two years a, a significantly growing problem with bed capacity at the state hospitals. And if you've been following the issue, you have recently become aware that we finally reached the point where we don't have as many beds as, as we need. For four years, it's been looming each year, getting closer and closer, and different things were tried to kind of uh, address the issue. And each of them was a short-term solution to the fundamental driver, which is that the private hospitals are just not taking as many of these patients as they used to. We are working on ways to not say they've got to take more, but just get back to where you were four years ago. Um, that would largely address the immediate need. Now, the the second part of this is everyone agrees that crisis care is the worst and most expensive way to treat mental health crises. What we'd like to do is build out a more robust community service so that nobody reaches that point, or at least not as quickly or not as frequently. That's always the aspirational goal. And as Delegate Hudson said, sometimes the perfect can defeat the good. We can't wait until five years from now when there's enough services in the community that hopefully the populations are down. Right now, people need to be uh, uh, safely cared for and have a place to go. That's gonna be something we'll be working on. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next up, the Delegate Chris Runyon. Both you and Delegate Hudson are now political veterans in your second terms as delegate. How has your experience in Richmond shaped your 2022 agenda? And do you have any comments on the DAR legislative committee? Thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. And it's so good to see all y'all. And uh, I appreciate the question. I'll address the VAR agenda first. I agree the uh, last three items seem to be very technical. And I was, as I heard the question, I said, well, yeah, these are something that I need to hear more about and learn more about and make sure that we look at it from a completely holistic point of view. Uh, on the surface, they look to be pretty common sense. As for the uh, association healthcare plans, I, I'm very supportive of that. And I agree there's probably more sophisticated solutions to address healthcare in the Commonwealth, uh, but you all in particular and many other independent contractors have kind of been hit, hit hard and, and really carrying a, a, the brunt of the problem. And we've got to address that. It, it, it is uh, unfortunate that it was not addressed a couple of years ago when I think there was a bipartisan solution crafted in the General Assembly. So I'm optimistic that we can move forward on that. So I appreciate the question. What did we learn? And it'd be interesting to hear Delegate Hudson's comment on that because we're, we're freshmen or we're no longer freshmen, we're classmates. Uh, what I saw was that you can create much better public policy, in my opinion, and benefit the lives of the citizens of the Commonwealth much more effectively if you can have co a conversation across the aisles, uh, between the chambers, uh, between the parties. And that sometimes we did that uh, the last two years, uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, we did not, in my opinion. And um, uh, I think we've got to work hard to do that. Now, you know, you look at how the election results from, from November came about, well, we're going to have to work together. You know, the senator, uh, his party is going to control the Senate. And, uh, you know, the Republican, my party, is going to have uh, influence or control of the House. So neither one of us can force through an issue. And we all understand that. I think it is the best opportunity to create positive change that'll be very impactful for all of those. Uh, we're fortunate there's a lot of money floating around. Uh, we're perhaps unfortunate there's a lot of money floating around, so people are expecting all their problems to be addressed, and I don't believe there's that much money. But I am really looking forward to be able to go down and have conversations about policy in a positive way from all of us involved and figure out solutions. So thank you. Thank you. Very uh, positive outlook. It must be December. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, my, my, uh, list, my letter to Santa started with, please, I can explain. Um, the, uh, Senator Deeds, as one of the longer serving members, actually in both houses, um, can you comment on the political atmosphere in, in Richmond? How has, the, how has the pandemic impacted that climate? And what are your 2022 legislative priorities? 
So I'll thank you all for allowing me to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to serve. Um, you know, my priorities don't change. You know, I want, I want to make sure that we, the people that struggle with mental illness, no matter where they are in Virginia, have access to the services they need in the most efficient, effective way. And I think Rob outlined that we've got to find a way to invest more to rebuild our community services because it's just not efficient. It's not really that effective. It's not that humane to treat people in hospitals. Granted, we have to have hospital beds. We have to figure out a way to, to make sure we have an adequate supply because there will always be people that have that need. Um, one of the big problems, one of the things that we have to address, and, and a lot of my work is gonna to have to be through the budget because one of the things we're gonna to have to address is workforce. We, we've got a shortage of healthcare suppliers across the board, but in behavioral health, our behavioral health needs are acute. Um, we have a shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, clinic, licensed clinical social workers, counselors across the board. You know, in the past, we've talked about medically underserved parts of Virginia. Um, if, you, you know, from a behavioral health standpoint, just about the whole state is medically underserved. You know, we, we just have shortages everywhere, either, even in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads and Richmond, where we have more population. So we, we have a considerable amount of work to do, and that, that will continue to occupy a whole lot of my time. You know, I, the, in general, you know, the um, political atmosphere in, in Richmond, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm always a guy that, that sees a glass half full. You know, I'm always a guy that wants to be optimistic and looks forward, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to this session. Um, I've talked to the, to the incoming governor a couple of times, and I, I've assured him that we're going to find things to work together on, um, that, that, that we're, we're going we're to find a way to all work together to, to move Virginia forward. But in general, you know, I, I think the, the political atmosphere has not improved much in Virginia. Um, we've gotten more and more like um, the folks in Washington. We spend more too much time talking about partisan politics and too much time fighting. And um, that, doesn't, that doesn't help us move the ball forward. We've got to get back to, to the basics and figure out how to, to move Virginia forward, how to move everybody forward, how to, to make sure our, our business climate supports job growth and advancement all across the board, and that we build the best ed education system, K through 12 and, and secondary education. So young people can grow up in Virginia and build a future. You know. Um, We've just got an awful lot of work to do. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, Delegate Hudson, question for you. As you know, realtors, most of whom are small businesses, uh, have a significant impact on our economy. What initiatives do you see proposing or supporting to help small business in Virginia in the coming session? It's a great question, and I think that we have learned a lot of lessons in just about everything in the last year or two because everybody got unsettled, and we learned where the sticking points were in just about every process, the things that make it difficult. And I think that there's a lot that we can do um, to cut hurdles to small business formation. I think everybody's been talking about this economic downturn as the great reaccession the number of people who have reassessed what they're currently doing and maybe started a small business because they wanted to or maybe shifted gears. Um, and I think that what I've learned from a lot of the small business owners that I've been talking to is that there's lots of little hiccups and hurdles and red tape that slow them down every step of the way, especially in our increasingly remote world where a lot of that is mediated by very outdated technology. And I think about, especially for our state agencies, the many ways that our small businesses have to engage with the state. If you know, if you've logged on to the Virginia Employment Commission's website where you pay your payroll taxes, that website looks downright Stone Age, um, and it's it's not the only one. Um, so I think one of the things where I um, am excited to put a lot of my effort in the coming session and, and in the, the year or so ahead is in helping modernize our state technology so that we can better serve and support business development. By way of background, I, I think one of the few members of the General Assembly with training in software engineering, I, I teach at UVA, but got there by way of Stanford and MIT, um, so have a computer science background and um, would really like to help uh, the Richmond come into the 21st century um, when it comes to 
accessible, efficient technology in all of our state agencies so that we can be keeping up with what is the frontier of business so that we can be better supporting you every step of the way. Thank you. Um, Delegate Bell, realtors are about home and getting people home. The lack of affordable housing and workforce housing in Virginia is becoming a major issue, especially for first time home buyers. What are some things the state government could do to help address this affordable housing challenge? That's kind of a, that's a, a good and interesting question, raise a bunch of issues. I think that um, this is not so much a realtor issue, um, maybe at all, certainly not uniquely, but the, the rental crisis over the last, uh, just call it the COVID period was exceptional, acute, uh, raised issues that no one had ever thought they would get through. And the solution that was created got us through a crisis period. So as you know, there was a period of time when they were said there will be no more evictions. And then the landlord said, well, then there's not too many payments on the notes. And over time, money was set aside and it was largely uh, the landlords who then applied. I don't know if anybody knows this, but the landlords were the ones that applied because many of the tenants were either incapable not specific, in any case, we're not going to be able to do it. And so the landlords ended up applying. And so long as the tenant cooperated, there was a, there was a sort of a, a stream of money that enabled the rents to be paid, which enabled people not to be evicted and enabled the, the landlords to, to pay their, their loans. Um, that's not a permanent solution. Um, that was something that was a sort of a COVID solution, but the, we're, we're gonna come out on the other side of that. And I think many of the people you're describing in forms of in case of workforce are not necessarily looking to buy. Now, in terms of the larger question about, well, you're realtors and you want them to buy, you want them to sort of move from the um, rental market to the starter home market, and then over time, establish equity and buy a bigger house. I think that's a, I mean, that's almost just, that, that's almost an economy level question. So I am skeptical of many of the sort of the, the programs that would try to do this without increasing the supply available. I think that if you, you can try really hard to come up with uh, programs and ideas, but ultimately the housing costs will be reflected by supply and demand. And in a place like Albemarle, which, um, you know, I think we have this conversation every year, but when I first came into the General Assembly, and granted that was some time ago, the second fastest growing county was Fluvanna, the fifth fastest was Green. How weird. Neither of those have major employment. What's going on? Well, everybody locally knows what was going on as Albemarle said no. People wanted to work here. They wanted to live as close as they could. So Green and Fluvanna just blew up. Lake Monticello went from, a, gosh, a bunch of vacationers with their you know, summer homes from New Jersey and Long, Long Island to a place where people lived. Rutgersville did the same. We have seen some of the same growth now in Waynesboro, which would be, Albemarle is still a place that's very expensive. It still has restricted housing. And we were just chatting before, I forget with whom, I think Ginger, but right, that Briarwood. So Briarwood, which was a starter home community Literally no sidewalks, no basketball courts, no anything. I just got one basketball court, but no, no amenities just to keep the price down now has a half million dollar home. And all of us are chuckling at the fact that one of our neighbors is living in a half million dollar house. That's just a supply and demand issue. So I think in terms of if you want ultimately to have home ownership in a place like Albemarle, you can fiddle at the margins, but I'm skeptical you will have any long-term um, success absent a willingness to build more units. Thank you. The, uh, you touched on the question for Delia Brunner, which is great. Um, we, we did have uh, rental concerns, uh, eviction concerns. What do you think the state can or should do to help provide housing stability for the rental market in the current economic environment? Thank you. I'll, I'll echo uh, Rob's comment. That's quite an interesting question. And, uh, you know, as I'm thinking through that, to be frank about it, what we need to do to address the rental is to make sure the economy is robust, that jobs are available, well-paid jobs, and that ties back into our educational things. One of the things that I have as a legislative priority is how can we improve our career and technical education process? How can we have make sure that we've got folks that are, have the ability to be trained for the jobs that are necessary, uh, that are available to be filled, and that we can continue to rise, uh, ha have a rising tide for everyone. And so, you know, you've got that component of it. 
Um, going back you know, to the rental market, you've got to address the affordability issue. And uh, I think Rob's right on that. It's a supply issue. We have the same challenge on the west side of the Blue Ridge in various components. You're seeing uh, the uh, parts of Rockingham County, for instance, see significant growth and affordability is becoming unavailable for the average person out there. So they're being forced to drive further or move, live further and drive uh, further to their jobs. Uh, Stewart's draft to Waynesboro is Albemarle West. And, you know, just no doubt about it. And you see the amount of traffic that flows back and forth across 64. And again, that's people responding to what's available in the marketplace. I think those are local issues. The question probably needs to be directed to the supervisors in Albemarle County. What can we do to allow for growth or allow for housing for those folks that we want to live in our community so we can have a, a community of all people as opposed to you know, kind of the direction, to be frank about it, the kind of the direction certain communities have headed. And um, um, no silver bullet out there. Uh, the state, I think our role will be to figure out how to remove those bar barriers and obstacles, offer opportunities for localities to provide for innovative solutions. But when it all comes down to it, it's, I think it's, market, it's going to be market, marketplace based. Senator Deeds, um, there's been some discussion over the past few years uh, from both major parties discussing a holistic review and possible rewrite of Virginia's tax code. Among the ideas that have previously been included would include a tax on all professional services. While appealing to some in the business community, realtors have long been skeptical of that approach. Under this scheme, a typical buyer and seller of residential real property would see an average of 15 new taxes at the closing table. Considering the political dynamic and the economic turmoil uh, that such a change would, would have on us, what do you see as the potential for tax code reform this session? And where do you stand with regard to professional services being taxed? Well, you know, like um, Delegate Bell, I'm a lawyer. So I'm, I'm a professional service too. And so I, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know, I don't know where that's going to go. I don't know that that's going to be proposed this year. Uh, um, and I would be kind of skeptical of, of taxing professional services. I will tell you that, that our tax code in general has a lot of problems. You top out at your, at your top income tax in the upper teens of income. Um, it, it's just the tax code itself has a lot of unfairness built in. We've commissioned a, a two year study um, this year and next year with JLARC to try to, to figure out the tax code, to figure out what changes are necessary. It's gonna be interesting because the incoming governor will have proposals that regard some changes to the tax code. Some of our members have, have already made and been in the press with proposed changes to the tax code. You know, My preference would be to, to wait until we get the JLARC study back and figure out what adjustments need to be made to make the tax code more fair. That may mean some, some, um, some increases somewhere and some decreases in other places. Um, I, I don't, I would not favor that this coming up with, with a solution, rushing a solution in this session. Um, but I think there will be pressure to do that because, because that's part of the incoming governor's agenda. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. I don't, I don't, my guess is that in, in the Senate and the finance committee, it's gonna be very difficult to pass major changes to the tax code this, this time around. Thank you. At this point, I wanted to open it up if anyone had questions from the audience that's here. Al. ...requires that we, we have a balanced budget. Other states do too. Now, that doesn't mean we don't take debt. We, we, we incur, we have AAA bond rating, we have borrow money at the lowest rates around, well, buildings primarily, yeah. Absolutely. You know, the, what the surplus, the, the challenge will be, and, and the outgoing governor has presented that challenge in, in his face by trying to address some of our long-term needs through the, the, the surplus this time, which will be in opposition to the 
incoming governors proposed tax cuts. For example, you know, for, for many years, since the time of Chuck Robb's governorship in the early 80s, the goal, our goal, stated goal has been for our teachers to be paid the national average. Well, none of us are, expect our kids to be average. We want our kids to be above average. And I would, I would argue that if we expect, if, if we expect ex excellence from our school system, we have to pay for it. We have to pay for it. If we're gonna compete for the best talent in the country, we've got to pay for it. So the, the, the gov this governor, Governor Northam on the way out is proposing that we um, pay above the national average with teachers. And, and he's found a way to do that through the surplus. Um, that will stand in juxtaposition to the incoming governor's call for tax cuts. So there will, there will be challenges. There, there's no problem with us paying our bills. We're doing that, but we, we've got a lot of bills. Walter Stosh used to be chairman of the finance committee. He would talk about our bills in the drawer that we can't afford to pay this year, but we're gonna have to pay down the long, in the long haul. We've got some long-term issues we've got to address. Okay. Neil, could I hop in? Yeah, Delegate Hudson, please. Sure. I mean, we have enough revenue to pay our bills because we're legally required to. So what we do is we cut our bills to match our revenue. So for example, we closed five mental health hospitals in the state during the height of the COVID crisis, which means there were a lot of patients who couldn't go somewhere to be seen. We're about $2 billion in the hole on the state's contribution to fully funding the standards of quality for our public schools statewide, which would be meeting, meeting the Board of Education's recommendations for student teacher ratios and counselors. So we do pay all our bills, the revenue and the, and the expenses match up because they have to, we're, we're forced to by law, but we are shortchanging a lot of programs because we're required to. And so I think that that's the point that, that Senator Deeds is making in his, his statements about workforce and, and a lot of other issues. We're, we're getting by on the cheap on a lot of critical services and there are a lot of people getting hurt in the process. I would argue that over the long haul, Virginia has gotten by on the cheap. We've, we've been, we're more than frugal, we are cheap. And we have been historically a low tax, low service state, but we, there's a cost for that. Now, Sa Sally talked about the hospitals shutting down. The hospitals didn't actually shut down. There were people in the hospitals, but we lost 105 employees over two weeks because A, we're not paying them enough money and B, they're getting beat up by people that are admitted to the hospitals. So the hospitals are too dangerous. They're too overcrowded. And, and we, we've got to figure out how to pay people at a market rate. So we've got a long-term look at, at our employee situation, state employees. We've got education costs. We've got mental health costs. We've got costs across the board that have long-term issues that have to be dealt with. All right. Um, I'll, let, me, let me back up for a second. Delegate Bell, please go ahead. Yes, I, I was going to just sort of go through a couple of things. So to answer the original question you asked about the books having to balance, they do, but there's some caveats. And you've heard some of the caveats already that some, some mentioned, there's two more that are big ones. Notwithstanding the good year that VRS had in investing, our VRS fund is actuarially underwater, meaning that will, and that's contracted as people that have already earned it. This is not a sort of a go back in time and change the policy. It's, a, it's invested and that's billions of dollars. And at some point that will come due. The last time we were truly solvent was 99. And we have been under investing and hoping that the investments would catch up. We were way behind before we've had a good year, but it's still something that that's money that it's, it's, it's owed. Second, what we talked about a bonding. So we are appreciably further in bonded debt than we used to be just as projects came on and people said, let's build that road and pay it off as we drive on it rather than save up toward it. That sounds good, but everybody wants to do that and everybody doesn't want to continue on what the previous guy did. And so we have more bonded debt than we used to have. We have largely unwound the accounting tricks that were used in the last. And so, for example, the most obvious one was we scored the July 1st taxes into June. And you go, what does that matter? Well, it changes which fiscal year those get collected in. And so, you know, it's millions of dollars that effectively are used to make the books officially balance. Okay, within those caveats, you're right, Virginia has to pay its bills. We have to balance the books. The, the, at the end of the year, the, the ongoing budget has to balance. Now, this year we have a surplus, but it's important to recognize it's of two parts. One would be what we call one-time money, that you really can't assume that it's gonna be there next time. The rest would be ongoing revenue. At the margins, there's arguments about it. Is that really ongoing or is that something we probably don't think that it'll be repeated? At least from my perspective, what bucket that's in largely tells you how you should spend it. I don't say can spend it, but should spend it. 
not say anything deep here. If you use one-time revenues to create an ongoing expense, that's something that will be in the baseline next year. And you'll have to somehow figure out how to undo something where people have expectations. There are places that you can uh, obviously spend ongoing revenue. If you give someone a salary, the expectation is next year that salary will continue. That's why you sometimes hear these discussions about a bonus versus salaries. If you give someone a bonus, they appreciate the money, but the expectations are a little different. Eventually, over time, if you bonus, 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 at some point, they will say correctly, um, and we've done this sort of with some of the police groups, we appreciate the bonus, we're happy to get it, but please understand, we want the baseline salary to be higher, both so we can predict it, it impacts retirement and things like that. So I think those are going to be many of the issues that are coming up. Now, we do have a larger pot of money this year than in the past, both in terms of ongoing revenue and one-time expenses. And the budget is, as they say, just a list of priorities. You prioritize higher the things that you think are higher on the list. And so some of the things that people are talking about, the state hospitals, we keep saying state hospitals. So we're clear, this is, these are the mental health hospitals. I hope everybody understands. And so that is where it has gone from a looming crisis to an obvious right in front of us, got to do something. We have sheriff's deputies uh, sitting uh, with someone for days, literally days in an emergency room waiting for a hospital bed to open up. That's of all the possible outcomes, that's the stupidest. I mean, they're not getting any care. You're taking a, you know, a trained law enforcement professional and instead of at least being out doing the job we want for him, some counties are very small. Nobody thinks that's the right answer. So in terms of priorities, that's real high on my list. Everybody up here has a different priority list and that's what the budget will be. Thank you. Delegate Runyon. Um, in Virginia, because we're Virginia and we like to have elections, um, and we like to have one-term governors. Um, we have a governor proposing of a budget right now who will not be sitting in that seat come January. What are your thoughts about the surplus, the budget process, and your pr budget priorities? Um, the surplus, and, and Rob talked about it, you know, the money's in basically two different pots. And one time federal government money, we need to be very careful how we spend that and, and not create a future expectation that's going to require uh, future General Assemblies to do things that, that they, they have no choices over. And then we do have this incremental amount of money. I, I'm concerned, and, and Cree mentioned it earlier on, on some of the conversations we had, Virginia has a regressive tax system. I support removal of the grocery tax. We've got to figure out how to make localities whole. They've got to be held harmless on that. And you know, if we go back 20, 30 years, whenever it was, the car tax kind of was the same thing. And we probably didn't handle that one as well in making everybody whole on that one. So that's a, maybe a model of how not to do this. But I think it's important to recognize how regressive that tax is on folks that are trying to either get started with their lives and their families or have become uh, retired and on a fixed income. And we're experiencing right now, my children are 34 and 37 years old. That last month was the highest inflation they've ever experienced in their lifetime. Most of us in this room have saw, saw the inflation, the high inflation rates that we had in the 70s. Uh, and, and so it's not as new to us, but boy, to that family formation, age generation, it's a big deal. And so we've got to be responsive. We, we've got to understand how our public policy and our taxation policy impacts that. So, so we need to address uh, those on, on that. Uh, the governor, Northam, has pointed out a number of different areas that he would recommend spending money on. And I appreciate his opinion and his thoughts on that. It's highlighting some areas that probably we needed to have addressed for the last while on that. His method of addressing, I don't know that I agree with that. I need to study with that more. I've mentioned I support Governor Yunkin's, Governor-elect Yunkin's uh, reduction of grocery tax. I think he's bringing great questions forward that we as an assembly will need to talk about. Uh, increasing the standard deduction, uh, the military pay on that. Let's look at those things and see how they impact. Uh, an overall evaluation of the state economy. I, I've heard Senator Hanger say a number of times uh, that we've got an agrarian-based tax system. And if you think about that, that's probably true. And so this study that's being underway, it comes out in six months, eight months. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for the Commonwealth. And that's not just the elected folks, that's y'all too sit down and say, hey, these are some of the things that make sense now for the economy we live in. Let's try and address those things. Uh, uh, I, 
we'll go ahead and say it. I'm a small government guy. And, uh, you know, the comment we've been on the cheap or we've been beyond frugal. Okay, I, I can appreciate that perspective. I think we're better off having you all keep your money in your pockets and figure out how to be responsible for yourself. And we need to help those people that we need to help. The behavioral health issues, there's an area that in my mind is a pretty high priority issue. And there are a number of others. And I guess uh, Rob mentioned a budget is just a list of priorities. For me, I think we've got to take some hard looks at those things. And there's going to be some items that my guess is there's going to be things that are very popular with us that we're not going to be able to afford if we want to fix those problems like salaries for our public service folks. That I, I think we've got to. I mean, the state police is somewhere in the 30% uh, unfilled slots. You can't do that very long. Uh, Department of Corrections is somewhere in that same neighborhood. You know, they can't get folks to go in prisons. We, uh, the mental health issues, it's true. I, I've had a number of constituents call me, uh, you know, we have some mental health facilities in or adjacent to the 25th district and they feel unsafe. They've actually had some folks been injured because there's not enough people to do the job adequately. You all wouldn't want to do that. I'm not asking people to do that. So those are some of those high priority issues that we've got to address. Thank you. I want to uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, remind you all to sign in. That was one of my tasks. Um, and to thank our legislators. You all are very accessible and your staffs are fabulous. And when I get callbacks from your offices, I really appreciate it. And I will be calling and I'll call during session when it's busy and there'll be a vote coming up. And I know that those messages get to you and I really appreciate the tireless work of your staff to keep you guys moving forward, getting on the floor in time for votes. And I appreciate you taking the time out this morning to talk about our realtor issues and how we can help you keep our Commonwealth moving forward. Please join me in thanking our legislators. And we're done. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.